Okay, so part 10, and uh, there's a couple of changes we made to the car. Not major changes, but uh, still significant changes. Uh, we've put two 95 tires on the front now. So now the car actually has a square setup that has two 95s at the back and at the front, um, which changed the balance a little bit, but um, I have to go to the track to find out how much of a difference it made. Uh, before this, we were at two four five front tires, and they absolutely had really bad understeer. Uh, but the other thing is, I've put intercoolers at the back that right now do absolutely nothing at all. That's because the turbos aren't connected. But I just wanted to get ahead of things, that's why I just put the intercoolers in for now and um, made the brackets and everything. Uh, so that after the race, the first race is actually coming up in a few days. Uh, but after the first race, then I'll get started on the turbos. Just to explain why the intercoolers are over here. Uh, that's because we will remove the roof later on and add a duct over there that will feed air to these intercoolers and the air will exit through the trunk. That's the other hole I cut in the car. Right now it looks pretty bad, that's because uh, later I will add a vent over here, um, but right now that's not there. And I've also done a bit of electronic work. Um, this was a board I made back in my college days when I was a genius in circuit design. Um, I actually made this for a robotic arm, it was a project for my college, but I was left with one of these spare boards that I used in the car, and this is going to do a bunch of things. I have uh, two manifold pressure sensors connected here, and um, when the whole turbo and everything is linked up, so this will basically, it's a twin charge system that I'm working on, so basically this will control the valve and everything, and also the boost level. Uh, so right now it is controlling one thing in the car, it's hooked up to these two relays and it will control the rear wing at the back. Uh, so let me show you what we've done to the rear wing. Uh, so first of all, I've uh, made a new structure now in the trunk. Well, the structure was there before, but I just added a few things to it just to make it easier to remove. And there's also a motor over here now and a mechanism. So that... Let me just show you something. And there are switches over here in the center console uh, with DRS written with a marker and turbo and max. Well, these two switches do nothing at all right now. They're not linked to anything. And that's because um, this is something for uh, what I plan to do later on on the car. But this one does work. When I flick this, uh, you'll see the rear wing at the back open and close. Just like DRS on a Formula One car. But um, with both elements, so it's going to be even more effective than the DRS. So yeah, I'll just show you how I made all these changes. So I started off by cutting a hole in the trunk lid. And I know this is probably the most painful thing to watch for any Mercedes owner. Um, seeing the, the trunk being grinded away. But um, this will make more sense in the later parts when the whole intercooling system and everything is working. But even for now, there's a structure in the trunk where the uh, spoiler mounts. And um, last time we made a really temporary thing for just mounting the rear wing. It was the same structure, but just screws coming out and the rear wing mounted on that. And it really made it difficult mounting and removing the rear wing. But this time it was way better. Now just one person can put on the rear wing and remove it. Um, so yeah, I just angle grinded the... Um, trunk lid away. Um, I had to do that in two parts. First um, do the outer part and then cut the inner part away. Uh, these two parts are glued together so they're a little hard to separate. But then I opened the trunk lid and um, completed the um, cutting. So once the whole part of the trunk was cut away I just um, Moved the trunk just to test how rigid it was and it was pretty surprising that even after cutting so much of the trunk lid off the trunk lid was still pretty rigid. Um, then I closed the trunk lid and I positioned the rear wing where I wanted it to be and then I put these two things on underneath the rear wing. These are the things that were, the rear wing will eventually mount on and I tack welded the um, things the things that the rear wing mounts on. I, I put everything in place and then I tack welded those two things in place. Uh, just because this was the best possible way I found to get everything exactly where I wanted it to be. And once the tacks were complete, then I took off the rear ring, opened up the trunk, and then I completed the belts.
So now you can see the um, structure that's underneath the trunk where the spoiler mounts. Uh, it's a little hard to see in this, but still you can tell. Uh, so after once all these changes were made, it was really easy to mount the spoiler. Just one person could do it. Um, this is a bit of a heavy spoiler. Uh, that's because one, it's really big. And the other thing is it also has all that mechanism that allows it to move all the bearings and motors and linkages. So all that does add weight to the spoiler. Um, but yeah, now it is pretty easy for one person to mount. Uh, so then after this, I got to the part of um, making the intercooler mounts. And I'm not, I'm not going to talk too much about this because the whole thing isn't even done yet. Um, so I'm just going to wait for the part where uh, I make the turbos and then I'm going to talk about all this, why I'm placing the intercoolers at the back and what's the whole plan. But for now, I just made the brackets and uh, mounted the intercoolers, and bolted them to the roll cage and then uh, bolted two supports at the top to the frame of the car. So now talking about the tires, I got two new 295 tires for the front. Um, before this, I was running 245 tires at the front, which wasn't a good decision because there was a lot of understeer because of that. But um, I decided to mount the newer tires at the back and the older tires from last year at the front. Uh, the 295 tires that were at the rear, I mounted them at the front. That's just because I was thinking that um, this setup would add a bit of oversteer, so mounting the older tires at the front would hopefully counter that a bit. The other thing was I had to add these 5mm spacers at the front, that's because when I put the tires on they were awfully close to the suspension. Uh, so after adding the 5mm spacer it got away from the suspension and um, after that there were no clearance issues. Um, I was expecting mounting such a big tire at the front it would touch the fender or something. My fenders are slightly rolled but um, still it was surprising it just fit right on and um, there were no clearance issues or anything. Uh, now talking about the balance, obviously moving to a square setup from a staggered setup, I would expect a bit of oversteer, so I've stiffened the front suspension up a bit just to counter that. Um, but really I'll have to go to the track to find out what the balance is like right now. Um, street driving the car, it seems fine, it doesn't seem unstable or anything with like oversteer or something. It doesn't feel like an oversteer setup. Um, but obviously once the tires get up to temperature and um, you're actually on the track that's when you really get to tell if everything is working fine or not um, but it's looking positive so far now the other thing I've done is this is the accelerator pedal from the E55 and I've put a switch right here and what will happen is when you press the accelerator all the way there's this little kick down thing at the bottom here and right when you press that it will also push the switch and this switch will control the rear wing So now for the rear wing, I didn't film the whole thing when I was making these changes um, for the for making the rear wing move, but I'll just talk about how we did it. Um, I added these two big ball bearings on the sides, and these two top elements basically pivot on these ball bearings. And there's a mechanism on this side. And there's these few linkages, and then a motor over there. This is a window motor from a car. It just has a plastic cover on it to protect it from rain. And um, well, the controller inside gives it the signal and it opens and closes uh, the top two elements depending on um, what you want. There's a switch with the accelerator pedal and when it detects that you've pressed the accelerator pedal completely, it will open the wing. And when you'll release the pedal and go onto the brakes, the wing will close again, which will uh, maximize the downforce, but also maximize the drag. So this was something I thought about when I was designing the wing initially, um, but I didn't have the time to actually make the whole moving part last time. Uh, I'll show you how it's supposed to work. Let me just flick the switch up and open the wing. And the reason I designed the top two elements this flat was because now when you look at it, the air just passes completely right through. It's like not having a rear wing at all. Um, there's no downforce it makes at this position, but there's no drag. It um, it doesn't increase the drag of the car either. So that's the biggest benefit of this design. Uh, that's why I've kept all the elements almost as flat as possible. Only the bottom side is a little curved, but the top side is almost perfectly flat. Uh, so yeah, that, this was the idea behind the big wing. Um, but yeah, I still haven't tested this on the track. Well, last time when uh, we went on uh, in September when we went on the track, I did play around with the angles and saw what difference it made and it does make a really big difference with the rear wing at its maximum downforce position 
Uh, the car only hits 173 down the straights with the rear wing completely open in this position. Uh, the car hits 183 kilometers. That's a 10 kilometer per hour difference. It's a pretty huge difference in terms of drag and it also makes a big difference in terms of downforce. So when you have a moving wing you can basically have that top speed advantage down the straight but have that maximum downforce advantage in the corners. So it's like the best of both things. Um, that's why I'm really curious to test this out on track and um, see what type of flap time differences it will make. Alright, so I just want to talk a bit about the race that's coming up, CSCS Round 1. It's coming in 5 days, it's on May 28th. Uh, so the next video is going to be on that event, but expect it to be a few days after the May 28th because it just takes me a while to edit and upload the videos. Or actually, the other thing is I also started using Instagram recently. I know I'm the last person on earth to start using Instagram, but I'll link it in the description below, and um, I'm trying to get into that now. So I can, it's a quicker way to just take pictures on the event and just upload them. So hopefully people can um, get quicker updates on what's going on. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, talking about the track. Uh, the first race is at uh, Mossport DDT, which is a driver development track. It's one of those small technical circuits. It's mostly a handling track. Uh, so it's not a track well suited for the E55. Um, it's something that's well suited for small handling cars like the Mazda Miata or S2000. Um, so if, yeah, that's um, the E55 is like downforce doesn't even work on that track. So I'm not expecting to do too well in the first race, but I'm still really excited to get back in the car after such a long winter and um, see how it goes. Um, it's also one of those tracks that where a drive a good driver can make a big difference, but it's my first time going there, <laughs> so I can't expect to do too well. But um, it's still good. It hopefully it's still gonna be fun. So yeah, the next part is gonna be about the CSCS round one, and um, let's just hope everything goes well for that. And yeah, see you in the next part.